Forgotten City, Chapter 11. Kobe led the party with Asha checking the rear and Fionn between them. Kobe went as fast as he dared, and he sensed Asha's occasional impatience as he held them back for a few more minutes here and there. She's never had to do this before. She doesn't know how easy it would be to make a mistake. They're at the school, she said, as they paused under the shelter of a towering oak. They won't find us out here. We can't take risks, said Kobe, and how he wished he'd never taken any. From the moment he met them, he'd thrown all of his caution aside, and look where it's gotten me. It was three hours before they reached the bridge. As much as Kobe was on the edge, he felt glad to be heading for the lab in search of his dad. But when he saw the sky ahead, he groaned. Across the cityscape were more snatchers than he'd ever laid eyes on. Maybe 30 crisscrossing over and among the skyscrapers, all hunting for us. Change of plans, he said. We have to go a different route. He led them back 300 feet to where a junction split from the main road into an underground transit tunnel that ran beneath the river. The opening had partially collapsed and looked like the mouth of a plant-strewn cave. In there, said Asha, we have no idea what's down there. Shouldn't we stay above ground? Kobe could hardly say he relished the thought either, but they didn't have a choice with all the snatchers prowling the sky. You can sense waste-infected creatures, right? Asha nodded. Yes, but okay, so you can warn us if there's anything nearby, said Kobe. Asha smiled uncertainly. I could warn you, but it might be too late by then. Fionn touched her arm. Kobe was beginning to understand now. The physical connection between them, uh, the physical connection helped them communicate. I know that, said Asha, sounding a bit exasperated. But that was one wolf, Fionn. We have no idea what lives. She glanced at the tunnel entrance. Down there. Fionn looked at Kobe, then back at Asha, who drew a deep breath. Fionn says, you know what you're doing. I know if we stand around talking much longer, we're asking for trouble, said Kobe. We can't waste time. We need to keep moving. He began to walk down the ramp towards several concrete slabs 10 feet tall, which lay across the entrance. Dad had said they tried to close some of the roads when the infected when the infection took hold to quarantine the city. Way too late, of course. The airborne spores of the waste didn't care about roadblocks. He jumped and gripped the lip, then hauled himself onto the top. The other two followed reluctantly. Kobe reached down and helped them over. As they glanced to the other side, Kobe took out his flashlight. The view picked out in the flashlight's beam wasn't inviting. Giant shrubs with ghost-like branches and thorns spanned the tunnel, growing in and through cracks in the walls. Bulbous yellow fungus sprouted from abandoned cars. Everything gleamed with a slimy, moist sheen. <clears throat> Kobe wondered if his dad had ever come this way and what he would have made of it. No, he never would have done anything so stupid. Then again, he never had dozens of snatchers on his trail. But we can't turn back. It's the only route out of the snatcher's view. <clears throat> Stay focused and we'll get through this, he said, trying to sound confident. He took out his crossbow and handed it to Fionn. The young boy held it with much conviction. He's more likely to shoot himself in the foot than anything else. Kobe nodded to the dart gun hanging around Asha's waist. Is that set high? D9, said Asha. Lethal dose. I don't know how many shots it will give, though. Kobe began to walk, picking a path between the cars. It looked like there'd been crashes down there, because among the vegetation in the cars sat raggedy skeletons, still coated in fragments of clothing. Strange, tropical-looking flowers sprouted from the eye sockets and crumbling skulls. Kobe heard Fionn and Asha's steps falter whenever the flashlight beam fell on another horrible sight. It's all right, said Asha. They can't hurt us. Kobe kept the flashlight moving. He wondered how acute Asha's telepathic senses were. She'd picked up on the choker plants a moment before the ambush near the hospital, but there could be plenty other things lurking down here. Things Kobe couldn't even imagine. After all the years of care careful planning and execution, all the lessons his dad had drilled into him about being cautious, here he was breaking every rule in the book, rushing headlong into the unknown. <clears throat> Up ahead, the center of the tunnel had collapsed with plants growing at strange angles at the ground as the ground dipped. Kobe crept toward the lip. There's definitely something down there, said Asha. 
I feel it. The only way across the hole was the trunk of a tree lying over the center. It was wide enough to climb over, and Kobe thought it would take their weight easily even if they all crossed together. Still, the idea of walking over the abyss was risky. If there were choker plants lurking below, they'd be sitting ducks during the crossing. Kobe shined his flashlight over the edge. Below was another road with remains of a couple more vehicles. Something was moving at the dim edges of the flashlight beam, but when he tried to pin it down, it was gone. He shrugged off the backpack and took out the flare gun from the inside. He had only three spare flares, so he had to be careful. Let's see, shall we, he said. He aimed the flare gun and fired into the abyss. The green light spilled over the debris of the car and the knotted plants. From several places at once, cockroaches the size of cats swarmed to get out of the brightness. They scuttled off into holes and gaps and grates. Asha jerked back, letting out a short hiss of breath. It's all right, said Kobe. They're ugly, but they're harmless. He took the crossbow back from Fion and handed him a taser from his belt instead. This is better at close range. If anything comes near you, just point and shoot. They crossed the trunk to the far side without incident. <clears throat> Kobe took out the city map from the emergency bag. It wasn't as detailed as the map back at the school, but at least it had all the city's roads. He traced their tunnel into the city where it branched off in several directions. We can cover a lot of ground down here, he said. I don't think the Snatchers will be able to follow us. They continued through the abandoned tunnel, flashlight beam playing over the eerie swamp-like growths. The plants down here were less vibrant than above, the air slightly rotten. Even waste-infected plants did better in the sunlight. Kobe measured their progress roughly in his head, picking markers every 100 feet or so. Soon, he was sure they must have reached the other side of the river, and as the tunnel branched, he took the leftmost junction. Wait, whispered Asha. She closed her eyes for a moment. I sense more choker plants. I think they're up ahead. She raised the rifle. They slowed down, and Kobe drew his machete. Let's check it out. Neither of the other kids argued, but Kobe sensed them a fraction behind him as they crept farther, rounding a bend. Asha was right. 200 feet up the tunnel was almost entirely blocked with a monstrous explosion of pale roots, some more than three feet thick. They grew from the floor and into the tunnel roof where the concrete was broken apart. Kobe's flashlight beam played over the tangled branches. There was a way through to the other side, but it would invoke clambering between the knotted limbs. At any point, the choker plants might stir to life and wrap around them like constrictors crushing the life of their prey. I think we have to double check or double back, Asha said. Kobe realized she was right. He checked the map again and saw there was another way, a much longer route. We just have to hope it's not blocked too. They'd taken a few steps when Asha stopped again. Oh no, something's coming. Kobe heard it too, and his heart pumped harder. Something mechanical, a hum of hydraulics. Snatchers. They found us, he said. He began to move back towards the choker plants. Wait, said Asha, we can't. Kobe's dad had always had a theory about choker plants. Time to test it. Kobe crouched and picked up a lump of shattered concrete from the floor. Drawing back his arm, he hurled the block as hard as he could. It thumped into the pale limbs, then rattled down to the ground. The choker plant didn't move an inch. Perhaps we can make it through, he said. Are you insane, said Asha? My dad's always said chokers were more sensitive to vibrations toward the tips of the vines, he said. The roots, not so much. If we're careful, I think we can make it. You think? Trust me, said Kobe. Fion nodded his pinched face bravely, and Asha let out a grunt of frustration, but came as well. The slanking of the snatchers were echoing closer. Kobe imagined them flooding over the car wrecks, sensors scanning the darkness for signs of human life. Once they locked on, that was it. There'd be no hesitation. We don't have long. Kobe tried not to let his fear show as they approached the, gar the gargantuan root system. He shined his light to show the others the way and hopped over a horizontal twisting trunk. Asha helped Fion scramble onto the top and Kobe lifted him over to the other side, then followed. The rest of the structure didn't move at all. Asha was trembling. I could feel it, she whispered. It's all around us. 
They had to crouch under a looping branch, then squeeze between more of the thicket. Kobe couldn't help feeling they were entering the stomach of some massive beast, which wasn't far from the truth. But as he shined his light through the shadows and coils, he could see the other side, maybe 75 feet away, not far. Suddenly, more, more light trickled through the roots around them. Kobe glanced back and saw a snatcher rounding the bend of the tunnel. It picked up its pace, scurrying toward the choker plant roots.